Well, good morning. morning. It's good to see you here this morning. If we haven't met, my name is Pastor Michael. I have the joy of serving as lead pastor here. And I'm thankful for our elder team who've given me and my family a few weeks to recharge after a very busy holiday season. It's kind of a joke among pastors that you celebrate holidays after the holidays because things are so crazy up until New Year's typically. We also are adjusting to having a newborn baby in our house and the process of adoption. And baby is here today, by the way, in case you're wondering. We have a lot to be thankful for, a lot of adjustments and steps ahead of us. And my brother and sister-in-law are here from North Carolina as well. Would you give them a warm welcome with their two little boys? Thank you to the ladies of the church who put on a beautiful baby shower yesterday for us. Thank you for that as well. So, by the way, um, I, since I'm not preaching today, I want to introduce you to a friend of mine who's going to be bringing the word. This brother and I met when we were part of the Community Care Task Force, together commissioned by the Genesee County Sheriff, Chris Swanson. He had this grand idea of having hubs around the county during the shelter-in-place order. So from March to May of 2020, we had the joy of being one of those hubs for the northwest quarter of the county. We were able to give food and toiletries and other items to well over a thousand people actually every week for about 10 weeks in a row. And I see heads nodding in the back. Those of you who have participated, that was such a blessing. We prayed for every carload of people that came through our parking lot. And Brother Swimp and I met during that time. He helped us out and helped other food hubs around the county. And I got to hear his story. And it's an amazing story of gospel transformation. How God met him when he was incarcerated. And how Jesus changed his life and is changing, continuing to change his life. So some of you may recall that last summer, about a year and a half ago, well actually summer of 2020, Seems like a little bit of a blur once in a while. But summer of 2020, he shared a brief version of his testimony here in one of our worship services. And so I've invited him to come and preach as we continue our series in Philippians, Rediscovering Joy. And in Philippians chapter 3, he's going to reflect on how the Apostle Paul experienced gospel transformation, the whole turnaround in his perspective, his priorities, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the gospel of Christ And we're going to hear a little bit about Pastor Swimp's own personal experience of that gospel transformation and what God is calling us to do to live out in the power of the gospel. So would you invite and warmly invite Pastor Swimp up here? I'm going to pray for him as he... Come on up, brother. Would you give him a warm invitation? And let's let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for the opportunity to gather from your, around your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would work through your word. You have not promised to bless our stories, but you have promised to bless your word in the pro- proclamation of it, in the teaching of it. We pray, O oh God, that you would change us from the inside out, that you would continually transform us more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. As we come to your word, as your Holy Spirit works in us, may your glory and power be seen through us. Guide our brother here as he explains and applies your word. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord, everybody. Can you hear me? Is my mic loud enough for you? I have a loud voice. I want to make sure I don't overdo it. Amen. We're going to try this one more time. One more time. Praise the Lord, everybody. The last song that we heard, it is well with my soul. What a blessing it is to be before you in God's house to say it is indeed well with my soul because we have joy. Does everybody in this room have joy this morning? We have joy because of the resurrection and the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Amen, somebody. It is well with my soul. I just want to add a little bit more to what Pastor Mike said. The thing that really connected Mike and I, Pastor Mike, and really drew me to him was that we both share a passion and a vision for, for, for something that we don't, we don't often see. And that is God's house reflecting God's heart. Say it again. God's house reflecting God's house. Well, someone will say, well, Pastor Stacy, what do you mean? I mean that I've always wanted to be a part of a church, a fellowship, 
that was a multi-ethnic, economically diverse church where the extreme rich worship with the extreme poor, where we don't care what we look like, we don't care where we came from, we don't care about anything except one thing, and that is Christ Jesus. Amen, somebody. Amen. Amen. And I know for a fact that he shares this vision, and we kept talking about it, and, and, I, and, and he's been saying, he's been telling me for some time now that he wants to see Mayfair and every zip code in Genesee County. How many of you share that vision? Amen. And we can do it because we know that that God doesn't have preferences or limitations, that's our hang-up. That's not God's limitation. Amen, somebody. Amen. So I just want you to know how we really connected once we met it. Yes, we were both appointed uh, uh, by, by Sheriff Swanson to work on the, on the task force. But the thing that I was so moved by, Pastor Mike, and I got to tell you, his wife Stephanie, that's my sister from another mister, let me tell you. <laughs> she, she is a powerhouse, and uh, uh, I, I don't want to embarrass her, but I, I th Stephanie reminds me a little bit of some of our civil rights activists. She's very, very uh, vocal and very passionate about a lot of different issues, and it stunned me to see just how passionate she is about some of those things and how awesome it is that you have a pastor and a first lady or, 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 or the wife of the pastor here that really loves God and cares about the least among us. And this is what I love about Mayfair because I know you too share a heart for the least among us. And I want to thank you. This church supported our Angel Tree program this past Christmas. And I want you to know you bless so many underserved families who have a mom or a dad who are incarcerated and families and, and affected by incarceration. Mayfair supported this year. Uh, this past year, May, Mayfair supported the year before then. So give yourselves a hand for having a heart that reflects God's heart. Give yourselves a hand. <laughs> Amen. Now, we talk about joy. You've been hearing for several weeks now things about joy. Pastor Mike talked about joy and humility. We heard Pastor Angel talk about joy and friendship. One of the things that we know, we've learned, and we've heard it time and time again is Joy, true joy, doesn't depend on anything about us, but rather it depends on everything about God. Amen, somebody. True joy doesn't depend on anything about me. There's nothing about me that gives me joy. There's nothing about you that truly can give me joy because I'm going to tell you something. You can find yourself in a situation and you need something greater than what you feel, what you hear, what you see. You need something, more far, you need something far more powerful than that. We're going to get into that today. So right, on the, right, on the, right up here, you see joy is from the Holy Spirit. So let's get right into it. Chapter 3 of Philippians. Chapter 3 of Philippians. Let me give you a second to turn, your, turn to your word. Chapter 3 of Philippians. I'm not going to read 1 through 3, or 1 through uh, 16 all at once. I'm going to read, let's say, verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Now, before I go on, before I go on, I just want to say, remember, Paul was in prison. You heard that from past, from Pastor Mike and Pastor Angel. He was in prison in Rome. When he wrote this. Now he had been to Philippi before. He had said these some of these things to them before. Now, yet again, he's telling them, "Look, I'm, I'm going to say these things to you again." And the reason why I'm going to say these things to you again. It's because it's in your best interest. It's safe. Many times we hear someone say something like, well, I know you don't want me to preach to the choir. How many of you heard that before? All right. And that sounds like something that's a negative thing. It's, a, it's a, you know, preaching to the choir. Well, Paul is saying, I'm going to preach to the choir. <laughs> I'm going to preach to the choir today. I'm going to tell you something that I've been telling you, and I'm going to say it to you again and again and again, because by, so, by my doing so, it is safe. For you. He's saying spiritually safe. Spiritually safe first and foremost, but not just that. Beware of dogs and beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. Now that's not exactly politically correct language, is it? Beware of dogs. Beware of evildoers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Somebody say none. none. Oh, you don't sound too convinced. None. Somebody say none. none. And they say, Pastor Stacy, this, is, this isn't an old Baptist church. I know, but this is just how I do it, y'all. 
<laughs> so we have no confidence in the flesh. Though I also might have conf- though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth of the day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning, a, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted for loss. Let's talk about joy for a second. We're going to pull up the first slide. We're going to, let's talk about joy just for a second. Did you know that joy has been mentioned 200 times, up to 200 times in the Bible from front to back. Joy was mentioned up to 200 times from front to back in the Bible. But not only that, joy was also mentioned, joy and rejoice was mentioned 16 times. 16 times in the book of Philippians. Now, God apparently is intending for us to understand that joy is very important. Amen, somebody. Clearly, joy is very important when he's telling us 200 times in the Bible and 16 times in the book of Philippi. Now, joy, we need to understand something. Joy is from the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is from the fruit of the Spirit. So go back to my title, because we've been hearing many things about joy, but this is what you need to know. The kind of joy that God intends for us to have the kind of joy that can get you through a circumstance that your, your education, your, uh, your, your social relationships, whatever you think you have going on about yourself, there's some things. Have you ever been through something in your life and you knew you needed something greater than yourself, greater than what you know or who you knew? You needed something more powerful, and that was you needed God. Well, in order for you to experience the kind of joy God is talking about, you have to be born again. Amen, somebody. You must be born again. Now, think about this. Someone might be saying, well, why are you saying this to a church full of Christians? Well, it's very simple. Because I'm telling you, if you go and you study Revelations when Jesus was talking to Lydia and Sardis, he, you know, he commended them for, for, for certain things, but he also chastised some of them because they had a routine of getting together. So just because someone is going to church all the time doesn't necessarily mean they know Jesus. Amen, somebody. I'm not talking about anybody here in particular. Don't don't run me out of here. (laughs) I'm saying to you, let's be sure, each and every one of us, that we've taken the time to know for a fact that we have a personal relationship with Jesus because that is the only way we're going to experience the kind of joy that God is talking about. Let's make a distinction. When I say the only kind of joy that God has for us in mind or the kind of joy God is talking about, Folks, I'm not talking about an emotion. I'm not talking about an emotion. I'm talking about a condition of the heart. I'm talking about an anchor in your soul. We just got through hearing it as well with my soul. Well, hey, when the storms are raging, when the storms are raging and we don't know which way to turn, we need something a little bit more than how we feel. Isn't that right, folks? Because it doesn't feel good when we're going through certain circumstances. So that's when we're talking about happiness, right? Happiness tends to, tends to associate itself with our liking something, our liking someone. We feel good. We like a circumstance. It's kind of temporal. It comes and goes sometimes. We're happy. Joy is something that I have. I can have it no matter what's going on. It makes sense to me that God told the Israelites over and over, Paul told the, Philipp- the people in Philippi, over and over about joy because Christians more than anybody, the Israelites more than anybody, were going to go through persecution because of the name of the Lord. Amen, somebody. And when you know for a fact, especially them, that you are probably facing execution or murder or crucifixion or being put on a log and cut in half, well, folks, you needed some joy. (laughs) You needed something that would keep you going and, and, and cause you not to turn your back on the Lord and cause you to continue having hope. And that is something in our time that you cannot have unless you know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Now, how do you know if you have the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, you don't know if you've had the Lord Jesus Christ just because we've been attending church. You don't know that. Now listen, I, 
grew up attending church. Okay, I grew up attending church. Now, I grew up Catholic. Now, I'm not, before anybody, I'm not talking about the Catholic church. I'm not saying, I'm talking about me. <laughs> okay, I grew up in the church. I grew up Catholic. I was an altar boy. Okay, I went to catechism. And I want you to know that after having done all of that, I still didn't know the Lord. I still had never accepted Christ as my Savior. I still didn't have joy. I still had no idea who Jesus Christ was until I was about 26 years old. What happened then? Well, I then met a gentleman named Bob Ayers, who in the midst of my adversity, when life seemed to be over for me, came and found me where I was at and told me about Jesus Christ in a way that I had never heard before. And when it was all said and done, he led me to, he led me to Christ through a specific prayer. And the thing, it was very simplistic, and we read about this in Romans chapter 10. When, we, when, when the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ has died for your sins and was buried and rose from the grave, thou shall be saved. Amen, somebody. That is the only thing that it requires of us to be saved. Just believe God to be who he said he is and to believe God to have done what he said he has done, which is to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. That's it. And it's just, as simplistic as it seems, there are a lot of people, and again, I'm not talking about anybody in Mayfair. I don't know. But I'm telling you, there are a lot of people who have a routine of going to church, a lot of people who are religious who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Who have never personally asked Christ to be their Savior. Man, look, the good thing is, if they're in church on a regular basis, even if they've never made that personal confession, they're still in the right place. Amen, somebody. We'd rather have them there than somewhere else. But we need to make sure each and every one of us, anyone watching on YouTube, anyone watching on Twitter, we need to make sure that we have asked ourselves that question, have I ever asked Christ to be my Savior? Have I ever made that personal confession? Because that, my friends, that, my brothers and sisters, is the prerequisite. That is what is required of us if we're really going to know the kind of joy that God is talking about. Now listen. We are living in a, in a time now where the Bible talks about we live in perilous days, in dangerous times. We have a pandemic. We all know we're living in the middle of a pandemic, right? We have uh, people dying. I have personally lost eight people, eight people in my own family to COVID. Eight people. Now, <laughs> what, that, what, what that said to me is that, you know, we're, we're living in some times that we, we, better, we better be checking ourselves personally and in the house of God, giving ourselves a, a, a sort of a litmus test to make sure that we're right with God. I'm not going to get into the politics because that's irrelevant to me. I'm going to say it again. It's irrelevant to me. Because at the end of the day, I, I'm tired. I, I don't know about you, but I'm tired of seeing God's people tear each other apart over politics, somebody. Because at the end of the day, it is the power of Christ that we have to depend on now. Amen, somebody. It is the power of Christ, the Holy Spirit, that we must depend on more than ever before. Not my politics. Yes, I'm like anybody else, sure, I've got some strong views on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, that's not going with me to eternity. <laughs> at the, listen, at the end of the day, it's not my politics that's going to convince somebody to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. That's not, that's not going to do anything for somebody that doesn't know the Lord. The first thing they're going to do, they're going to look at me and decide whether my life reflects the grace and love of God, somebody. Amen. That's what they're going to do. And if it doesn't do that, my politics are relevant. So I want you to be clear. I'm not talking about politics when I say I'm kind of weary. I'm, I'm, how many of you are tired of it? How many of you are tired of somebody looking at you crazy because of what you feel? At the end of the day, if you, if you, read, if you read our Bible, the Bible in, in Romans, I believe it's chapter 14, 
If I'm wrong, I know Mike, Pastor Mike going to get on me later on about this. <laughs> but I believe he's talking about doubtful disputations. Whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Whatever you do, and you have people who are arguing with each other over meat, arguing with each other over this, arguing with each other over that. At the end of the day, the writer was, look, look whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. So let's make sure as we go forward in these perilous times, in these dangerous times, that we are making, that we are, we are making, we're asking God to help us that our character reflects the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love, kindness, gentleness. Because that, my friends, is what the world needs from us today. Amen, somebody. Amen. That, my friends, is what the world needs for us today. Now, Paul, you heard me read, was saying that, you know, he was zealous in the past about some things. You had, he persecuted the church. Paul essentially was giving a bio about himself. He gave a bio about himself. Why? Because, you know, there were certain people who were a little bit puffed up about, about themselves. Now, you know, that's nothing new under the sun, right? We got some of us, some of us, when I say, uh, me too, I've been there. I know what it is to think a little bit more of myself than what I should. Am I alone? <laughs> I, I know a little bit, I, I know a little bit about getting a little puffed up. You know, I know a little bit about that. When I, when I started, you know, I went to uh, uh, seminary, and I, I started learning about juvenile justice, and I started getting into politics, right? And then I started traveling around the country and doing public speaking. And after a while, before I knew it, man, I was on Hannity. I was on the Mike Huckabee show. I was traveling all around the country doing conservative speaking, and, and I didn't realize it, but I thought I was something. I thought I was something, right? And I forgot somehow, unconsciously, unintentionally maybe, but I forgot, man, Aren't you the same guy that brought God brought up out of, <laughs> you know, aren't you the same guy that when you were at the end of your rope, you needed the Lord, and now you think you're something? How many of us have been there, right? We think we're something because of our politics, our education, our background, maybe the zip code that we live in, maybe the accomplishments of our father, or our mother, or, you know, we put our confidence in these things that are perishing, these things that have nothing of eternal value. And Paul, you know, I could just, you know, I'm a visualist. I can just picture Paul somewhat laughing at some of these, of some of the Pharisees and some of the people of his time. They were a little puffed up. How many of you remember the story about people arguing around Jesus Christ himself about who's the greatest? All right? You had disciples with the Lord arguing with each other who's the greatest. Now, in my best English, they were crazy. <laughs> they were with the Lord Jesus Christ arguing about who, but this is the natural inclination of man. We think highly of ourselves. This is why the Bible has to tell us, don't think too highly of yourselves, over and over, right? And we have a tendency to read the Bible in an otherly fashion. Many times we read the Bible and we're thinking it's talking about somebody else because I'm not like that. Let me, hear, let me tell you something. We all have blind spots, every one of us. Every, no, there's nobody that can see yourself and see ourselves exactly the way we are. And if we could, we wouldn't need the Word of God, and we wouldn't need the Bible, and we wouldn't need each other. Amen, somebody. If we could. So we actually cannot see each other as we are at all times. So Paul was saying, look, <laughs> don't, don't have confidence in yourself. Have confidence in the Holy Spirit. Have confidence in the redemptive work of Christ. Have confidence and the God who had the power to raise him up from the dead, because at the end of the day, <laughs> that's the only thing that really mattered to Paul. Paul was like, look, I, I, I've done it all. I've, I've been a Roman citizen. You know, I've, I, I've got this education that really none of you have. I, I've got some things, some accomplishments that none of you have. I've done some things that none of you could do. But at the end of the day, Paul was saying, I consider it worthless. It's, it's dumb. One version said it's dumb. You know what dung is? <laughs> okay. It's, 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 it's manure. <laughs> okay. It's more, it doesn't mean anything. And so me, personally, I found myself after 2012, I was campaigning for uh, 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 a presidential candidate. Let me just say, I ain't going to say who, because I don't want to turn nobody off. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was campaigning uh, for a presidential candidate. I worked on two uh, presidential campaigns, four senatorial campaigns, three congressional campaigns. All right, I did a lot of that, travel around the country, you know, doing conservative speaking, you know. But 
I called my aunt one day. I called my aunt, and, it, and I didn't realize they had been maybe two years since I had spoken to her. You're talking about aunt, my aunt Delane. I, I, I love her. She's my heart. And I, I was, you know, normally I would talk to her frequently, but somehow, you know, we kind of lost touch. So I called her up, but she was apprehensive. She wasn't too happy to hear from me. And I couldn't, Auntie, what, what's going on? How, how you doing? She's like, yeah, uh-huh, 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 <laughs> you know. And she said, well, let me, let me ask you a question. I said, what is it, Auntie? She said, do you think I'm stupid? Now, this is my auntie who asked me this. I'm like, I think I better be real careful how I answer this question. <laughs> I said, no, no, Auntie, of course not. What are, you, what are you talking about? You know why she asked me that? Because she had seen me in the media and my politics making generic statements that kind of put her under that umbrella. And I never, I never thought about it, you know, because at the time I was so zealous about my politics that I wasn't thinking about how I was affecting my family or affecting people who, you know, may, maybe they weren't uh, Republican as I was at the time. Maybe they weren't conservative as I was at the time, but they were still decent people who were sincerely working and doing the best they can. And here I was putting all the casting these dispersions on them and calling them every name in the book. I'm ashamed to tell you. And at the end of the day, it, it really shook me up like, man, you know, I, I didn't mean to hurt my aunt like this. And it got me self-evaluating. And I, and I started praying about it. And I'm here to tell you that at that point, I began to denounce what I began to call my own conservative idolatry. I'm not talking about anybody but me now. I'm saying I denounced it because I, I realized that I was talking more about my ideology than I was Jesus Christ. I'm talking about me. I was talking more about policies than I was Jesus Christ. The Bible, the Bible says, he who saves souls is wise. And I reflected and I realized that in that two or three year period, I didn't lead not one person to Jesus. Not one. Not one. Sure, I made money traveling. I, I, I did all these things, but I did nothing of meaning or value on behalf of the kingdom of God. And when that hit me, it hit me like a ton of bricks. And I cried and I repented and I vowed to God, I'm done. <laughs> I'm done. And I haven't looked back. And I just asked the Lord to open up an opportunity for me to serve him and, and preach the gospel. And, 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 and that's what I've been doing ever since. But it was a lesson for me that I hope somebody here can learn from. Maybe you weren't out there on a public platform the way I was. But it could be with our own families, our own friends our own fellow church people. What are we prioritizing? What are we putting our confidence in? Ask yourself, what are you putting your confidence in? And if it's not, if it's not the Lord Jesus Christ, if it's not the power of the resurrection that God displayed that's in his hand, if it's not furthering the gospel, then I pray that we reflect and we ask ourselves, Lord, and ask ourselves before God what changes we need to make that we might be effective witnesses of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. We're going to go, we're going to, go to our second slide. Now, <laughs> Paul warned of dogs, evildoers, and he said the mutilation. Dogs, evildoers, and the mutilation. Now, how many of you know that if I do some street evangelism and I start calling people dogs, evildoers, and talking about their mutilating folk, how many of you know I'm probably going to go to jail in today's society? <laughs> okay? They're going to come, I'm out of there, right? <laughs> if I do it, if I, there's some things I would love to tell you now, but I don't want to get Mayfair picketed, okay? <laughs> I don't want folks showing up at Mayfair next, one, next Sunday, you on Fox News or MSNBC, but I'll tell you this, the number one threat to joy. I'm not talking about emotion. I'm talking about the number one threat to your confidence in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ is false doctrine. False doctrine. Now look, we're not dealing with Paul's day where we're walking into the community and you got folks that are blatantly you know, in your face talking about another gospel. We're living in some different times. Now we have art, science, education, music. We have all these different things in our society 
that are influenced by the God of this world that are intended to do one thing, and that is to turn you and I against the gospel that we have received. Amen, somebody. So Paul understood that very well, because time and time and time again, we saw him teaching and preaching through the scripture, beware of false doctrine. And in one instance, he wrote, I believe it was Galatians, because he had went to the city of Galatia, once came (laughs) and, and, and left and heard that they had already abandoned everything that he had taught. So he wrote them again and asked a very simple question. He said, have you so soon lost your mind? <laughs> have you so soon? Now these are, listen, the writers of the gospel, the writers of the epistles were heavy hitters, folks. They were not politically correct. Let's be honest. <laughs> okay? They were not politically correct. Paul realized that, look, I don't have time for games. I got to tell these folks the truth because that, they, their salvation might depend on this. Their hope might depend on this. So I have to just tell them the truth to beware of false doctrine. Folks, let me tell you something. I am not ashamed of the gospel. So let me just tell you, I'm all about traditional values. Amen, somebody. I'm all about traditional values. I will stand and I, I'm not trying to impress you. I'm not trying to impress you. I really mean this. I will stand on the word of God, come what may. I don't care how society now decides that God's word is not true. I don't care how society now tries to redefine gender and marriage. And now that, you know, I don't care what's, I don't care what's going on in society. I'm holding on to this thing right here called the word of life. How about you? Anybody else? I'm holding on to this thing called the world of life because I realize that if I turn to the right or to the left of, of God's word and I start conforming to our society, secular humanism, the thing that's going to happen, you know, the Bible said, Jesus said, whom the Father gives me, none snatches him out of my hand. So I know there's no way if I'm holding on to God that anybody's taking me out of God's hand. We know that, right? But how many of you know you can give away what God gave you? <laughs> you can essentially make a decision to walk away. You can make a decision to turn your back on the living God that gave you grace, that gave me grace. But I tell you what, Paul didn't do that. I'm not doing that. And for what Pastor Mike tells me about, about this church, and from what I've seen, I don't believe most people in this room are going to do that. What am I talking about? One of the things that I love about Mayfair, and Pastor Mike has said this to me many times, that this is the church where people really care about, I think he phrased it, the careful handling of the gospel. I love that. It's very, it's very similar to what Paul experienced in Berea. Because unlike any other place that Paul had went to, the people in Berea, they were like, okay, Paul, yeah, we, we, we know, yeah, okay, you're the apostle, Paul. Okay, that's fine. We're going to be checking out everything you say, Paul. <laughs> right? Everything you say, we're going to be checking it out, and we're going to let you know whether what you say lines up with the Word of God. Amen, somebody. That did not make Paul mad. In fact, that made Paul glad. He was very excited and happy to know that people care so much about the Word of God. So coming here today, man, I was, I was pumped up and excited about that. I'm going around some folk that actually care about the gospel, right? They don't want my performance. They want to hear the Word of God. Amen, somebody. I hear somebody, I see somebody now, I'm like, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And that's a great thing. So I'm here, so you can handle it when I tell you that we have to make sure that we're holding on to sound doctrine. And the other thing is, the other threat, failure to depend on God's word. So what does that mean? <laughs> How many of you have read the story about the temptation? When Satan tempted Jesus, he tried to, right? And he kept tempting him over and over. If you do this, if you bow down to me, I'll give you this. You know, why don't you put yourself on this mountain and cast yourself off? If you who you say you are, the angels will come and save you, right? He kept tempting him. Finally, when Jesus got tired of it, he, re- he began to rebuke Satan. But something he said really caught my attention. He said, man shall not depend on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And we've heard that in the the Bible before, because even in Job, he talked about desiring and depending on God more than food and water. Amen, somebody. And in Proverbs, we read in Proverbs where he tells us, 
you know, not to depend on your own. Do not lean on your own understanding, right? But trust in the Lord God with all of your heart. And then he will direct your path. Amen, somebody? So if I really want to hold on to this joy that's dependent on my personal relationship with Jesus Christ that was given to me by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that's based upon the redemptive work of Jesus Christ, I got to make sure that I'm staying close to the Lord and staying in his word. Now, my pastor in Detroit, Pastor Linnell Caldwell, First Baptist World Changes, I heard him say something years ago, and I, I wrote a note. I, I never forgot that. He said, isn't it interesting that a pilot, where every time a pilot gets on a plane and flies a plane, they have a checklist, right? We got to do this, we got to do this. He go, he doesn't just, even though he may have been flying for 25, 30 years, he does not just jump in the cockpit and start flying, right? He, he, he goes by this checklist. I got to do this, boom, 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 boom. And I've actually seen this because I was blessed uh, this past, this past uh, winter, last winter, to go down to South Carolina and see my mother, and I was able to take my son into the cockpit, right? And I was pretending it was for him, but I was really, I was, it was really for me. <laughs> I was very excited. I was, trying to, I was trying to shield it, but I probably, on the inside, was more excited than my son. Like, I'm in the cockpit. Oh, yes. And I watched them. I watched them go through their checklist. Now, if a pilot will do that, in order to make sure that he's flying the plane correctly to get you where you need to go, wouldn't you agree that we need to do the same thing in our personal walk with the Lord? Why would I try to walk this walk with memory alone when each year I get older and older? Okay, I wish I got younger and younger, but yeah, each year we, got, we get older and older. My memory is not what it used to be. I need, I need to make sure I'm getting in this Word of God day in and day out and studying this Word of God so that I'm hearing from the Lord and that what I'm hearing is not just my imagination, it's not the subtle things that we see on the commercials, it's not just what somebody's telling me in society, it's not what some political pundit is talking about, it's not what just my friends are talking about, it's coming directly from the Word of God. I need to make sure that I am depending on the Word of God. Amen, somebody. Because if I'm not depending on the Word of God, see, that's where we get in trouble and we get self-confident. Now, what am I talking about now? I'm saying the world tells us that the most important thing is self-confidence. I'm here to tell you that the world is wrong. The world is wrong. <laughs> Everything about the world, it tells us self, self-esteem. Self-concepts, self-confidence. I'm here to tell you, I'm not, I'm not so interested in self-esteem. I'm interested in God-esteem. Amen, somebody. I'm not so concerned about self-concepts. I'm worried about biblical concepts. Amen, somebody. I'm not so concerned about what level of self-confidence I have. I'm asking God to help increase me in God confidence, confidence upon who he is and what he's able to do, what he's already done, what I know he can do for me no matter the circumstances. Amen, somebody. I'm not concerned about confidence in me. Confidence in me always gets me in trouble. Always. <laughs> confidence in me has always gotten me in trouble. Confidence in what I think I know, what I've done, what I've experienced, what I've read, what I've learned, what's, has always gotten me in trouble, especially with God. Now, maybe nobody's been to jail or any of these extremes, but you may have been in trouble with the Lord. Amen, somebody. Maybe you've never had a fall like I had in my youth. But self-confidence might have disrupted your, your, your relationships in life. It could be your marriage. It could be your relationships between siblings. Because we put our confidence in something other than God. And when we do that, the first consequence of that is that we lose our, cons our ability to love each other. Because now, you know what happens? When we start being too self-confident and we put our confidence in things other than the Lord, we start measuring each other up and expecting each other to live up to our preferences. This is how we get in trouble. Preferences come from confidence in anything other than God, folks. <laughs> now look, 
<laughs> Don't get me wrong. I, I, growing up as a black American, I care about some things based upon how I grew up. Yes, I, there's a, I care a lot about justice. I have some ideas or some concepts or some views about some of the things that are happening in society as it relates to inner city communities. But I, I, I'm always reminding myself, and, I, and I, I thank the Lord for my relationship with Pastor Mike because we talk about this. I'm always reminding myself at the end of the day, regardless of what I think, regardless of what I feel, I need to make sure that I'm lining up this thing with God's word. I need to make sure of that. Because if not, we can be sincere. And I heard Pastor Angel talk about this. You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. You can be sincere about your concerns for, it, for justice, but then you can perpetuate injustice because you're doing what you want to do. It has nothing to do with God's word. Amen, somebody. <laughs> so we got to be careful that in our preferences, and our confidence about preferences and the things that are perishing, that we are not putting those things ahead of God's purposes that he invites us to. I'm saying it again. Be careful that we're not putting things ahead of God's purposes that he's inviting us to. I know time is winding down. So I'm going to give you a quick example. What do I mean by that? So, Think about Moses when Moses went up to Mount Sinai, right? Moses went up to Mount Sinai and heard his voice. He saw the burning bush. We know the story. But let's talk about the process so we can juxtapose that with what I'm talking about. The first thing that happened when Moses went up there was God introduced himself to Moses. Amen, somebody. Moses, Moses, I am the Lord thy God. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Jacob. He told him who he was. Isn't that what God does for us? When we were moseying about our life, doing whatever it was that we were doing, we weren't thinking about the Lord so much as he was thinking about us. The Bible says, not that we loved him, but he loved us first. So then, then after God told Moses who he was, he told Moses his purposes, not Moses' purposes, God's purposes. Moses, I remembered my people in Israel, and I made a promise to Abraham. It's my intention to free them from bondage after 400 years. So Moses, I'm going to invite you to come and serve my vision, my purpose. And then I'm going to equip you to go out and do it. <clears throat> but you're not going to do it your way, Moses. You're going to do it my way. Now, we know Moses was scared. I, I can't speak that well. I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't do this. God said, I got you. Here's, a, here's this, here's, here's, a, here's a ride, you can turn into a snake, you perform all these miracles. Here's my point, y'all. We got to remember that this Christian walk is dependent upon God, his purposes, his power, his equipping us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't have that, folk, we don't have anything. Say it with me. If we don't have that, we don't have what? Anything. Anything. Last slide. Last slide. Where do we go from here? Now, I believe that when we hear the gospel, God speaks to each and every one in the room. Each and everybody, whether you know it or not, has had an encounter with the Lord today. Now, it may not have been audible, sure, but that didn't mean you didn't have an encounter with God because whatever you got out of it, that was God speaking to you. Amen, somebody. Whatever you got out of it, that's God speaking to you. So make sure you walk away from here today knowing that you have had an encounter with God, not because of how well I preach or don't preach, not, for, not because of anything other than the fact that you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit and God has a message for you today, but most important, he has something he wants you to do about it. Amen, somebody. Amen. He has something he wants you to do about it. So where, are we gonna, where do we go from here, folks, today? I pray that the first thing happens is that we recommit ourselves. Why am I using the word recommit? Because you've been hearing a series called Rediscovering Joy. Rediscovering Joy. And Paul wrote this letter to the believers. That letter was not written to non-believers. This message today is not necessarily intended for non-believers. It's for those of us who profess the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. Amen, somebody. So let's seek, let's, let's, let's seek the Lord and let's ask ourselves, Lord, <laughs> seek me and know me and try me and reveal to me anything that's in my heart and in my mind, any preference, any arrogance, anything about me that's preventing me 
from being who you want me to be, from doing what you want me to do, from leading others to Christ, from edifying my brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Lord, please help me to be who you want me to be. And the only way that can happen, folks, you got to stay in the Word of God. So you know what? Maybe you work, you're very busy. I understand that. People are very busy. Sometimes you can't sit down for two hours and read the Bible. But maybe you can get an auto book. But whatever you do, whatever method you come up with, let me encourage you, stay in that Word of God every single day. Amen, somebody. Amen. Every single day. The last thing, the last two things. Recommit yourselves to the service of the Lord in and outside of the church. Listen, when we were born again, the Bible said that we were all given gifts of the Spirit for the edification of the body of Christ. We were not saved to just sit in the pews and listen to the pastor every Sunday. Amen, somebody. We were not saved to do that. We were, we were saved so that we can serve. Say, saved to serve. We can't do that if we're just sitting in the pews and not asking God to help us serve one another. And that's why I said in the church and outside the church, because I've been in situations to where the church is very zealous about doing mission work on the outside of the church, but indifferent toward the person sitting right next to you in the pew that you see every single Sunday. Make sure that's not you. Amen, somebody. Make sure that's not you. Lastly, let go of anything that is not helping you reach forward toward the goals ahead of you. Now, I'm not going to get too deeply into that because you have Pastor Smith that's going to be coming in here and preaching on the next section of, of, of Philippians. But I want to say this to you. Make sure that you're letting go of preferences, any arrogances, any confidence that you might have in anything other than God so that when you're going forward, when you're moving forward, you're pressing forward toward the goal, not based upon your education in the world, not based upon your political concepts, not based upon where you graduated from school, not based upon where you work or what title you have in the community, not based upon some pedestal man has put you on because of something about you, but based upon the Lord Jesus Christ and the redemptive work of Christ. Now, Paul said it in Philippi. And he said to the people of Philippi, he said, look, he's talking about the resurrection, the power of the resurrection. Really, that's what he's getting into. Because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ demonstrated by God, I know that God has the power to do anything that he says. Anything that he says. So why would I put my confidence in something that does not have the capacity to raise me from the dead? <laughs> okay? My president can't do that. Any, no former president can't do that. There's no Democrat, no Republican, no Libertarian. I don't care what. There's no one that can raise me from the dead but Jesus Christ. Not my mama, not my sister, and my confidence, I love them, is not in my mother. I love my sisters, not in my sister. I love my, I love my family, but my confidence is not in my family. My confidence is in the one who rose Jesus from the dead. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask Pastor Mike to come up. Now, I talked to Pastor Mike about this before I decided to do this. I want to challenge you today to respond to the gospel message that you heard today. I didn't say pressure you. Think about it. Think about it. If there's anyone today, I'm going to pass the mic to carry on with this. Anyone today that heard something that applies to you, respond to it. Respond to it. Let me close out with a prayer, and I'm going to pass this on to Pastor Mike. Then he will put out the message of response. Mike. Father, in the name of Jesus, close your eyes, folks. Let's do this. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity today to share the gospel with my brothers and sisters at Mayfair. Mm -hmm. Lord, I, I pray that you would seek us and know us and try us, each and every one of us, and reveal to us on this beautiful morning that you have made anything that is not pleasing unto you, Lord. Show me, Lord, where we've had blind spots. Show us where we've had blind spots and we've been putting our confidence mm -hmm. in something or someone other than you. Mm -hmm. Help us, Lord, to, 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 to understand where we've been failing each other in love and grace because of our concerns about society and what's going on in society. Help us, Lord, to, uh, to, to restore our confidence in you. Help us to get in your word, Lord. Lord, we repent before you today. We repent in sincerity of heart. We repent, Lord, for where we've fallen short 
of depending on you. Mm-hmm. And finally, Lord, the Holy Spirit prays for us and intercedes for us and moanings and groanings in which we know not. So well, I don't always know what to pray for. I don't always know what to say. None of us does. But we know the Holy Spirit who indwells us and gives us this great joy, mm-hmm. this confidence mm-hmm. that keeps us through trials and tribulations, mm-hmm. that enables us and sustains us no matter the, the storms that rage in a seas on our behalf, mm-hmm. even as I pray. So we thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the redemptive work of Christ. I personally thank you for our brother Mike. Sister Stephanie, I thank you for the staff here. I thank you for the believers here at Mayfair and the work they continue to do in the church, outside the church. But I, lo- I know, Lord, that we can, we can do so much more if we would just consecrate ourselves unto you. In Jesus' name, mm-hmm. I pray. Mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> There's a gospel equation I want you to get in your head, not original to me, it's this. Jesus plus nothing equals everything, and everything minus Jesus equals nothing. This is why the Apostle Paul said in verse 7 and 8, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but manure dung so that I may gain Christ Jesus plus nothing equals everything Everything. and everything minus Jesus equals nothing 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 I want you to stand the worship team is going to lead us in a song